which represents this area right here, including uh, Sewanee and the city of Lawrence. Uh, so with that, Senator Karen Shack. Hey everybody, I'm Zara Karen Shack, and I'm what you call a freshman senator. I represent Gwinnett and North Fulton, specifically Lawrenceville, Duluth, Berkeley Lake, Pitcher Corners, North Cross, Alpharetta, Swanee, and Johns Creek. So it's a huge area, approximately 200,000 people. And I uh, was newly elected in November and have the honor and privilege to serve you at the legislature. Uh, this is in my district and my house is very close by so I appreciate that because after fighting Atlanta traffic to get here <laughs> Once we're done, I can almost walk home. So I might get some exercise um, A couple things I wanted to say that is most important and I think is the biggest difference about me particularly and And I know representative Park already does this. I want to hear from you so if you see something in the paper and say, oh, that sounds crazy, are they really doing that? Email us. If you say, oh, I have an idea for a great bill or a law that's awful and needs to be changed, email, call, you know. I have people texting me when votes are going up saying, oh, I hate this or I like this or whatever. I want to hear from you. So, what do I want to hear? From the classroom. <laughs> From you, woo, y'all, y'all gotta talk, man, woo! Now you can tell I'm flying high here because I've been session all day and then I was in the Judiciary Committee presenting a bill, so I'm still riding on that. Once I get tired, I'll collapse. But um, who do I wanna hear from? You. You, thank you. And why is that important? I cannot represent you efficiently and effectively if I don't know what you think, okay? I'll be down there guessing. Now I'll be making my best judgments, obviously. But the whole point of representative democracy is the people to have a voice of, by, and for the people. A little bit about me since I am new. I forgot. In case y'all didn't know, I am originally from Georgia. I grew up very poor in Northwest Georgia. I got an appointment to the Air Force Academy because it was before the Hope Scholarship. We had no hope back then. I went to the Air Force Academy and I was an instructor pilot while I was there. I went and I was an intelligence officer in the United States Air Force, left the military to come back to go to law school, became a lawyer, and I am a lawyer. I sue and defend any number of people. I am a whistleblower lawyer in particular where I go after people who defraud the government and steal our taxpayer dollars. And when I say people, that includes corporations because they are artificial persons under the law, okay? But there is a big problem with that, and there's a reason you can't afford your health care because there are so many big companies defrauding us, okay? So that's one of my big practice areas, and then I do some other law. Why did I run for office? During the last election, my daughters, we go to school together every day, and I drop them off, and they're teenagers, so there's one of the few moments that you have them hostage. And their big observation during the last election was, Mama, nobody's being kind to each other. Everybody's yelling and screaming, and no wonder they can't get anything done. And that evolved to, Mama, I've decided you've got to do something. And I started laughing. I was like, what am I going to do? And my daughter said, well, Mom, you're a lawyer. You love people. You need to run for office. And here we are. <laughs> So when I look at everything, I look at it from three perspectives. I'm a mother, I'm a former federal prosecutor, I'm a veteran, and I'm also a wife. I try to bring my common sense and my experience to bear on every issue down there, even issues I don't know about. Last night we were talking about oysters, and I've learned a lot about oysters in the last 24 hours. <laughs> and there's, there's some oyster issues, y'all. Okay, so this is serious business. It is a big industry actually in Georgia. And uh, I, I need to tell you my committees. I'm on agriculture and consumer affairs. I'm on military veterans, homeland security, special judiciary, and on natural resources. Anything with the environment. So those are my four areas where I actually sit in committee, but I can bring laws on any number of um, issues. And I have several I have brought this year that I'm sure you guys are all examining. 
And if not, I encourage you to examine all the laws, which some of you I'm sure have, are going to ask us about. But that's a little bit about me, and I will sit down and we'll get started with the good stuff. Okay. So, so how about we do this? Because um, I, I want this to be uh, interactive, I want this to be a conversation. Uh, and there are so many different subjects that we can talk about and cover. Uh, but because it's still on my mind and, and something that I'm very concerned about, we can begin uh, our, our conversation this evening talking about House Bill 316, uh, which is the elections bill, which just passed the House a few days ago. And then perhaps I can turn it over to Senator Karen Schack to talk about SB 106, which is the Medicaid waiver. Uh, to begin uh, expanding, um, or, or I guess, yeah, to expand Medicaid here in Georgia, whether it's through a traditional model or via a waiver, which would be an untraditional model, similar to the approach that other states, such as Arkansas, have taken. So with House Bill 316, uh, that passed about two days ago on party lines. There is a 40-page bill uh, that was just heard for the first time today in the Senate subcommittee. Um, there are good parts of this bill, right? There are improvements in this bill. For example, in Georgia, this bill would provide for independent candidates to run for president and for vice president that did not exist before. Uh, with two very problematic statutes that were passed back in 2017, one being the exact match voter registration system, the other being the ability to purge voters. There were improvements made on that. Uh, with the exact match, Representative B. Wynn did a phenomenal job in really repealing that entire section. Now, if y'all are unfamiliar with it, brief synopsis on the exact match voter registration system is that essentially when you uh, apply or when you register to vote, uh, if your application does not exactly match to a T, including spaces, hyphens, and anything else, what is exactly on your driver's license, you will be essentially put into a holding pattern. Your, your application will be held and then eventually rejected. What we saw in the t during the 2018 election was almost 55,000 voter registration applicants uh, held. 80%, 80% were people of color. 70% of those being African American. Now, the great frustration I had with this was that the legislature back in 2017 they passed that system, this exact match, uh, exact match voter registration system, knowing full well the disproportionate impact it had on people. Because it was, there is current, there is pending litigation uh, given this disproportionate impact it had on people of color. And essentially the lawsuit, uh, or the agreement to the pending litigation and settlement was that because there was no state law permitting this, this would otherwise be struck down. Well, in the midst of that settlement, uh, the legislature rammed through, rammed through this legislation. This is when Stacey Abrams was our minority. She went to the House floor. We did everything that we could to stop this, knowing the harmful impact it has, especially as our state continues to diversify. And yet they still pass. So 2018 was not a surprise. Understanding the impact of voter uh, of this exact match voter registration system was not a surprise. But thankfully, we have made an improvement. The other part <coughs> is the, the, the voter purges. So with the voter purges, uh, federal law does require states to maintain its voter registration lists, right? That's a good thing, right? We want to make sure that folks who are no longer with us aren't capable of voting. We don't want dead people voting, right? It's common sense. That said, the way in which they handled this voter purge, where almost a million voter registration uh, uh, applications were, I guess not applications, but actual statuses, was eliminated from the voter rules, where folks who had voted in the past 10 to 20 elections found themselves on this list. Well, clearly we had cast a net too far. Essentially, if you did not vote in the past three years, you would be put on this list where you would receive notice and then be rejected, right? The amendment that they made to this bill is that instead of three years of inactivity, it's five years of inactivity, right? The great problem that I have with this entire system as a whole is that combined, what does it do? It's a, it's a hyper-aggressive system that, one, 
tries to push people off the voter rolls, and then makes it more difficult for people to then re-register the vote, right? And so, thankfully, improvements were made upon that. That said, I still could not support House Bill 316, because what it requires is for us to use new electronic ballot marking devices. The bill, for me, was a vehicle to ensure that uh, we give the Secretary of State authorization to purchase these machines, which would cost initially $150 million. And over the next decade, at the very least, cost hundreds of millions of more dollars for maintenance, for repairs, for storage, for a system that is vulnerable according to the, uh, according to the National Academy of Sciences and national cybersecurity and election security experts across the country. Now the debate that we had on this bill, for me was mind blowing, just because over and over and over again, we pointed out objective facts that these systems were more expensive than the alternative, which is hand marked paper ballots. That this system would be less secure than the alternative, hand marked paper ballots. And yet they continue to ignore common sense. Now my hope, is that we will continue to debate this issue, that folks will continue to email and call and even come down to the Capitol to talk about this issue, because we are talking about the foundation, the foundation of our democracy. During the 2018 elections, well, to take a step back, currently Georgia has one of the most vulnerable election systems in the country. One of the most vulnerable. Our system is purely electronic with the DRE machine. What we saw during the last elections, specifically with uh, the lieutenant governor's race, we saw almost 100,000 votes, 100 to 150,000 votes, disappear. What could be done about that? Absolutely nothing. There is still litigation on that issue. But why can't anything be done? These machines cannot be audited, right? The software in which these machines run are purely proprietary. So if you want to try and figure out what happened, why is, it, why is there this enormous data glitch where if you look, there is just this dagger where there is an enormous drop that cannot be explained. Dr. DeMiller, who is a professor at Georgia Tech, uh, a chair emeritus, uh, chair of computing, he came down and testified saying that it was a one in 10,000 chance that we could have this sort of data number. His testimony was ignored. And over and over and over again, we've seen the opinion and the recommendation of experts in this field consistently ignored. And so it raises further questions and concerns about why they want to put a machine between a voter and their vote. If you read the definition of electronic ballot marking device, which is on the first or second page of this 40-page bill, it specifically allows these, these ballot marking devices to integrate all these components, so it could so, so potentially be a machine. And it allows these machines to interpret, to interpret your vote. Why are we allowing machines to interpret our vote? Especially given that the system is. Right. And so this is a fight that we're going to continue to fight because it's fiscally irresponsible and it's, it undermines the trust that folks have. And without integrity in our election system, without trust, the entire system begins to crumble. Right? As, as elected officials, as politicians, we are here to serve them. Right? I, I had no intention of running for office. Right? I was fascinated with policy. I'm a lawyer by trade as well, similar to Senator Karen Schell. But I ran to hold my elected official accountable. Right? What is the government? The government is us. It is we the people. So feel empowered to have your concerns heard. Feel empowered to come down to the Capitol and make sure that the elected officials who are there, all those politicians, that they hear what you have to say. Because when all is said and done, we are here to serve you. So with these voting machines, uh, they were in the budget, the big budget that we voted in the House today as well. Again, the thing that was mind-boggling was they're not giving, they're not appropriating $150 million off of that. 
They're having us pay for these vulnerable voting machines for over 20 years. Over 20 years, they're going to take out debt that will end up costing us almost $240 million in the manner in which they want to pay for these systems that everyone, everyone has said are insecure. Uh, just today, uh, which, which I just love, FreedomWorks and another uh, Republican conservative organization sent out a letter saying, don't vote for these machines. Do not support this because it is fiscally irresponsible and, and, and they, they are insecure. We have hand-marked hand paper ballots that can do just as, as well. Right? And so now we have bipartisan support against this bill that the Secretary of State, and unfortunately our Republican leadership is pushing. Right? This should not be a partisan issue because we are talking again about the foundation of our democracy. Everyone should feel that their vote counts because that is our fundamental right. Our, our right to vote is the fountainhead from which all of our rights are derived. And so we have to do everything that we can to protect them. Imagine what technology was like 10 to 15 years ago. I don't know if we still had, I don't know if we had broadband back then. Flip phones, right. uh, I, I grew up in the age uh, of dial-up internet. Right. What is technology gonna be like in 10 to 15 years? We cannot foresee that, given how fast technological advancements occur. And yet we are trying to spend hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be fighting uh, to hold our elected officials accountable and do what's best for, for Georgia. Uh, so does anybody have any questions regarding these, these voting machines? Yes, yes please. Yeah. So um, I find it, are they, what are they so concerned about? Why don't they want paper ballots? Are they concerned because like a quote unquote, what they say, pride in certain areas. Why are they so afraid? Because wouldn't it help them also? It shouldn't be part of the principle. Sure. Shouldn't it help if they want to maintain power? So, so, so what? It, it, it's difficult, uh, I think, for me to speculate okay. why they want to do that, right? Um, I don't know if it's because uh, that one of the chief lobbyists of one of these vendors is now working for the Secretary of State which is documented fact, right? I don't know if it's because there is a desire to maintain a system that can be easily manipulated, right? I don't know if it's as simple as they think it's more efficient, right? Even though the, the bill would require uh, fewer machines, which would result in longer lines. And all these, all these costs would end up being passed down to the local level, uh, local government. Uh, who I ask, do not even know how much these would cost over the long run. Right? So there are potentially a variety of reasons as to why they might be pushed. Push and aren't your lines in there that say something about storage and staffing and all this? Yes. I want to read it in the yes. yes. So is there anything we can do at the federal level or just all state? We can't go to the federal level and say, we need help on this. So the U.S. Constitution generally provides that states run these elections, and, this, and, and our elections are controlled by local superintendents, right? It, it, it's a bottom-up process, and, and I think that makes sense for security purposes, but also, you know, this is 200 years, 250 years of just how elections in, in the country has been, have been done. Um, that said, um, there was a congressional subcommittee um, that was at the Carter Center. And what their purpose was, was to figure out and see whether or not there was a need uh, to, to, they're on a fact-finding mission, essentially to restore the Voting Rights Act, which was gutted, and the Shelby County versus Holder opinion that removed uh, preclearance from Georgia, right? Georgia would not have been able to do anything, any of these voting rights bills, had that Supreme Court case not been gutted. Um, that said, you know this is this is our fight, right? It, it is difficult, right? There there will likely and potentially be litigation if this does move forward, right? But that's the power of the legislature. That's the power of y'all's votes in electing us, right? And self determination. Um, and so it's hard. Fight is hard, um, but we have to continue to. to stay
stand and fight and speak out when we when we think that something is not. Email call, come down, and and I encourage everyone, right? If you don't like what your elected official does, run against them. That's what I did. All right, I was terrified when I did so, but I felt so passionate and so strongly about this issue, about healthcare in particular, about Medicaid in particular. Um, but again, we're all people, right? Um, we aren't anything special, right? We are here because because of the world. Any other questions? Yes, sir. When you talk about the push and the preference for paper ballots, I mean, truly just pure paper ballots or something that integrates the electronic but something that has a paper trail? Yes. Associated with thank, thank you so much. So when we're talking about these voting machines, you know, essentially the process is almost, it's, it's very similar, right? So you're, you're going to have a ballot, right? You're going to fill out that ballot. It's going to be scanned by a scanning tabulator and then dropped into a safe box, right? That, that's a hand-marked paper ballot process, right? With the ballot marking devices, it's the exact same thing, except that it'd be a touch screen where you would select your choice, it would print something out, that would then be scanned into a system and then dropped into a safe box, right? So paper exists on both ends, right? The cost of paper, which they were saying was, would be more expensive than ballot marking devices, is gonna exist, whether it's hand-marked or ballot -marked. The concern that security experts have brought up with the ballot marking device is that, and it sounds fine, right? The concern is that when it prints off that ballot, right, 30 to 50% based on scientific studies have shown that voters, they don't read it, right? They don't verify, you know, whether or not their selection was correct. <coughs> and so for all we know, a machine could, you know, select, uh, it's not difficult to imagine software where you click it one way and print something out another way. It's very simple. The other concern that was brought up with this bill is the potential for barcodes, right? This bill permits you to have barcodes. So after you make your selections on the touch screen, it prints it out, right? It could have a barcode and, you know, have, you know, the president for a vice president, it could have your selection. If the scanning machine reads the barcode that could be interpreted differently than the actual selection, again, it raises concerns. One of the biggest concerns uh, is the risk limiting audit process towards the tailoring. Because everything is pretty much the same, except this risk limiting audit process. But the person who invented that process said, you cannot do that. You cannot have a real risk limiting audit if it's a ballot marking device, right? You cannot have risk limiting audits and ballot marking devices. The only way you can have a true verifiable audit is if it's handled. Because that audit is to try and determine voters' intent, which you can determine if it's handled. You cannot determine voter intent if it's a machine's interpretation of what you voted. Right. And this is why election security experts, cybersecurity experts, over and over and over again have repeatedly stated, please, please, please use handmarked paper ballots as the most secure form of running our election. Now, throughout this debate, uh, I'll bring up two points real quick. One, the, a straw man has been created saying, you're going to take us back to the 1970s. You're going to create a problem where we had hanging chads similar to the Florida election. That could not be further from the truth. I think more than 20 states have a purely hand-marked system that has some electronic component, right? That, that's one. The second thing that just frustrated me to no end, the Secretary of State put on every single legislator's desk yesterday a memo comparing the cost of handmarked paper ballots over 10 years, which they said would cost about $224 million. And the initial cost of these ballot marking devices, which would only be $150 million. My speech at the well in opposition to this bill was, this is blatantly misleading. Conservatives today came out saying this is blatantly misleading. And again, it raises concerns as to intent, as to motive, as to why they're trying to mislead the public when it comes to this fundamental issue of how we carry out and conduct our elections going forward. And again, this should not be a part of the issue. Yes, sir? In regard to the electronic ballots, 
saying, you know, we have a paper ballot that can be verified by a human, right? Cybersecurity experts have dismissed that notion because, again, there's a machine interpreting how you vote. And whether or not the scanner is accurately reflecting your intent is something that can't be determined. Uh, the other concern with the software component of this is that in this bill, in House Bill 316, the, the software is proprietary. Right? There is no requirement for the software to be certified. Right? And so there's no meaningful way to check and ensure that this system is completely right. That's one concern, right? I, I think especially with what we've seen over the past few years, there are concerns of cyber attacks, of hacking, of tampering with these machines. But there are also simple issues as to why we don't want these machines. Machines break. Software has bugs. And we're putting our elections, right? We're putting, uh, you know, how we are going to be spending twenty-seven billion dollars a year, right? All those critically important decisions up to machines that could be hacked, that could break, that could simply malfunction. Why? Why are we putting the most fundamental component of our democracy uh, in the hands of a machine? That to me simply makes sense. But, uh, again, I. I feel very disappointed when I hear how they uh, put obstacles uh, ahead of people in regard to holding them back vote and trying to make it stupid. But then on the other hand, then I hear what you say, and uh, I'm very concerned that I want everybody's vote to be counted, but in my mind I also uh, you know, I speculate and I am like, okay, when we're doing uh, hand uh, mark ballots and they scan, uh, that scanning process is also electronic. Uh, could there be a mistake in that? And then also, if it's a matter of manipulating it, could they manipulate uh, you know, the, the process that comes from scanning the paper ballot on board? Yes. Uh, and uh, stuff like that. Uh, the only difference that I am, uh, I see here is that maybe if it comes to auditing, auditing it, then the paper ballot would be more reliable than the uh, electronic uh, paper. That, that's, that's exactly the point. That, that's exactly the reason why there was a Republican or two uh, who, had, who had focused on this issue, but introduced a handmark paper ballot bill a few years ago voted with Democrats against this bill, right? Because again, these audits cannot truly occur without, if they are not handled. I kind of get the, it's unfortunate, but I kind of think that probably their main intent is to manipulate this. Again, I, you know, it's, that's speculation, right? Um, that, that said, you know, whether it's uh, insecurity, in our election system, right, that all that does, I mean, that hurts everybody, right? If you can't trust who your elected official is, if you can't trust who your next governor is, or congressman, or senator, right, how are we supposed to, I mean, everything falls apart. Um, but it's not, that's not the only concern. Right? It's, it's for, for me as well, it's the cost. We are not being we are not being responsible as stewards of taxpayer dollars, right? Because we're not talking just $150 million. We're talking up to $500 million. $500 million over the next decade at the very least, right? Based on, based on how, these, uh, how these machines are funded in, in the budget, right? Even if we don't use, even if we don't use these machines after 10 years, We'd be paying for them for 20 years, right? Because that's the—it's a 20-year bond. That, that's exactly what it says on the line. Uh, 
Uh, so the question that I asked members of the General Assembly is, why are we paying more for a system that is less useful? And they can't answer that question. And it troubles me greatly that they can't. Any other questions on the or comments or on the on the voting voting machines, the elections bill? Yes, sir. I have a question. Um, I'm not going to ask you with the hardware shift and the software. And you said it increases the system and there's pressure and it can be automated. And so even in the curve, you heard of the get the process. Would it be pushing out that level? Would it be a strategy, for example, to capture a rider game that requires where it's coming? So, you know, during during this process, we have made Democrats, uh, Democratic leader Bob Trammell from Luthersville, have made multiple, multiple amendments to try and address issues like that. They were rejected. Bob Trammell's a representative? Good man. Um, and tell him I said it. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, uh, and, and you know, the, the control that we legislators have over uh, this process is through this bill, right? Because once this bill passes, it goes to the Secretary of State, where they do an RP, a request for proposals. We have no control over that procurement process other than the parameters that we set uh, through this bill. And those amendments were rejected. Right? An amendment was made to prohibit any vendor from using barcodes on these ballots. That amendment was specifically rejected. Right? So again, it, it raises concerns, um, and it continues to raise concerns, and because this issue is so paramount, right, it, it needs to be something that we continue to talk about and continue to talk about. Any other questions? Not. I will turn it over to uh, Senator Zark Okay. It was a very long hearing. I think it went on for four or five hours on the Senate side about these machines and this bill, and there are, are people actively coming down to the Capitol every day. And in case you don't know, you can go to every hearing. It's public. You can watch us online. You know, go to the legislegis.ga.gov. You can watch everything online. So you can see what people are saying. They they will they live stream our sessions when we're voting and they live stream committee meetings so you can see what we're presenting. So even if you can't drive downtown in the traffic, you can watch from home, <coughs> email and text and be actively engaged while something's going on and let us know what you think. So, um, a few things that I wanted to share with you that I did based on uh, hearing from folks when I was campaigning and um, things that have passed the Senate. And they have passed the Senate, so they've met the requirement to go to the other house before crossover day. So now all these bills are in the house for the house to think about. So the first one is dyslexia. So you'll notice I don't like using the bill numbers because I am dyslexic, okay? And when I was young, there was nobody helping with dyslexia, nobody identified dyslexia, and it hasn't gotten much better since then. However, there was a study committee this past year that studied the dyslexia issues in, in our schools, and there's a lot of information and studies that say if you don't intervene in a child's life before third grade and they can't read by then, the odds of them going to prison or having trouble in life are exponential. So what we have done is try to target that pre-third grade to identify children who might have dyslexia and to be able to get them some help. That bill was bipartisan. I was one of the signers on the bill and it did pass the Senate, I think, unanimously. I don't have the bill the number memorized, but it, it, it did pass with very significant support. And as uh, a person with dyslexia, I'm very proud of that. That was one thing I was very worried about my children having. 
uh, because I do have children, um, and I was very concerned that one of them would have dyslexia and not be able to, to read or write and, or do what they needed to do. And that is Senate Bill 48 for people who like numbers and don't switch them around like I do. Uh, the next one, which I'm very proud of, and I'm gonna bring this one up just, it hasn't passed yet, but I was in committee today making a presentation on this. As you heard me say, we are being defrauded in our government programs, and that's one of the reasons things cost a whole lot more than they should. My very first bill, as a former federal prosecutor, was to drop a bill to make it easier to bring whistleblower cases in Georgia. So that if you're aware of fraud happening at your company and you wanna uh, turn that in, it will be easier for you to do that. And we had a hearing today where I presented evidence on that and I had an expert to talk about it. And we have over the years that the, it's called the False Claims Act. The False Claims Act is a federal law and we also have 20, uh, excuse me, 30 states that have False Claims Act statutes we have recovered billions of dollars, upwards of $50 billion on the federal side, and at least $10 billion on the state side since about 1987, okay? And, it, and there were many years in, in the beginning that it wasn't very active, and then it really kicked in in the mid to late 2000s. And I will say that a lot of the biggest fraudsters are, yeah. I got a guess? Yeah. 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 No. <laughs> Medical. Medical, pharmaceutical. Pharmaceuticals, okay? So again, why your health care is so expensive. So that's a bill that I'm hoping we will be able to get across to the House, but if we don't, it will still be live and, and it can be brought up again next year. Our, our cycles are two-year cycles. And sometimes you have to get additional experts and have additional people come in the room and talk and you know, that way, Everybody feels good about it, and they understand it, and you know, that's part of the process too, is being accountable to folks and making sure you get the best bill possible. Having dialogue helps us get the best bill possible. The next thing is, when I was out speaking with folks, is the, the cost of when you go to the emergency room. So you have health insurance. Let's say you have health insurance and you've paid every premium. But lo and behold, you have a heart attack and you gotta go to the emergency room. Or you think you're having a heart attack and you go to the emergency room. But lo and behold, you get to the emergency room and you didn't have a heart attack. But they, they're gonna charge you like you did have a heart attack, you gotta pay these bills. And I've heard from so many people how they had gone bankrupt with this. It's called a surprise billing, and there are several bills that have been dropped to deal with that, and, and I also dropped one. When I say dropped, it means it went into, they call it the hopper, and it means it's, it's active, it's live. And so we also have a couple bills on that that I've also been talking to the authors of those bills and, work, and, and been able to have input in their bills. So I think you will see a bill that talks about surprise billing and trying to make sure that the patient is not the one in the middle trying to negotiate with an insurance company about paying a bill and that you don't go bankrupt because of that. So that is something that is, is a very high priority. Another interesting bill that I got to have part of, which was part of natural resources, you'd be surprised <coughs> things come up in natural resources. Organ donors. So you know on your driver's license you can be an organ donor and it says you're an organ donor. Well apparently hunters and fisher people, I won't say fishermen because they're men and women, outdoor people who get permits to hunt and fish, um, you can now say I want to be an organ donor and that's another way that organ donors can be identified. Now why is that important? Because if you've ever been on a list to get an organ you know why. <laughs> it's life or death. And so increasing availability for you finding a match or a person can help. And that we're trying to make it easier for folks to, you know, to have that help and to also increase the pool of people who would be available to help you. 
Now you'll also see if you look at what I've been working on, I have several veteran bills because again, when I was campaigning, a lot of people spoke about this. And when I, one of the bills I introduced was that if you retire from the military or if you are disabled and you get disability benefits in Georgia, they should be tax free. Now why would you want retired people to not pay taxes on their military income? So disability, okay? They are disabled fighting for this country. Why should they be paying taxes on the benefit that we're giving them to help? I mean, that just doesn't make sense. So, and there's been some confusion. Some people said, oh, they're already taxing him. No, they're not. I looked at the law, I went through it with the lawyers, and there are certain levels that they're not covered. And so we just fixed the law all the way around so that there's no confusion. If you get a disability benefit, and I mean, you're 10%, and you get a disability benefit, tax free. Okay. And, and we are currently getting what's called a fiscal note on that. A fiscal note means the bean counters down there are going to go count the beans and tell us, hey, General Assembly, this is going to cost a gazillion dollars. And if it costs a gazillion dollars, it may not be a good idea. Or they may come back and say, oh, this only costs $500,000. And that's outweighed by the benefit of having more of those kind of folks live here. Well, then. That might be a good thing, but that way everybody knows what this costs. So that will not pass this because we're still researching how much it costs. Now another interesting, an interesting bill, this is law enforcement. And um, as you heard me say, I'm a former federal prosecutor. Motor vehicles, has anybody ever forgotten to re-up their registration on their car and get that sticker on there and type. Anybody ever forgotten to do that? Man, I'm the only one. Oh, good. I mean, there's two of them. So good. Oh, three of us. Okay. So, did you get pulled over? Thankfully, no. 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 Did you get pulled over? No. Well, I got pulled over. Okay. And I was told, hey, we can arrest you right now because you're three weeks out or however long. I mean, you know, I was just bad. I was, I mean, you know, a month away or something, I don't remember. And in all truth, it's my husband's fault. <laughs> he didn't re-up it, okay? So, anyway, so they said, you can go to jail right now. And I was like, really? Oh my goodness, really? I can go to jail right now? I said, like, you're gonna haul away this car with all these poly pockets in here? <laughs> so, um, luckily I did not go to jail that day. Uh, because I did have a court appearance that day in federal court to go to trial. But there are people whose cars get towed, and that's their only vehicle, and they got to get to work, and then they get a fine, and they got to pay to get the car out of the impound. And the bill. It, they can't pay bail. Oh, that too, but I mean, it's right. just the, the money is stacking up that they got to pay. Wait a minute, I'm living paycheck to paycheck. You've now added five, six, seven hundred uh, dollars, not hundred thousand. $700 or more that I've now got to come up with and I don't have my car and I can't get to work and guess what I lose my job and so it's a cycle so one of the very astute law enforcement officers who's number 56 I'm number 55 in seniority we, we call ourselves the best for last I'm the double nickel and he's number 56 number 56 introduced the bill because not only does it cost money law enforcement gets tied up and guess what? They need to be doing something else. Like going after, you know, some, somebody who's really doing something bad. Um, you know, they, they aren't really supposed to be traffic cops per se. So uh, that bill passed today from the Senate. Uh, I think it was unanimous. And because he's a freshman senator, he was harassed on the floor. And that was kind of fun. <laughs> He'd get up and ask questions. And, you know. it's amazing. It's amazing. Exactly. That's what they call it. <laughs> So he did a good job, and, and I am um, happy to uh, have been with him on that bill like I was one of the co-sponsors. Now, another thing, um, this relates to veterans, mental health, and law enforcement. A lot of times you see when there's a situation where law enforcement and somebody get in a negative interaction and somebody gets hurt, it's a lot of times because the person has mental health issues. 
And it's not that they're doing something, they just, you know, they have PTSD or something else, which is related to mental health issues. Unmet need. They have unmet need. Thank you. Unmet needs. You must be in, the, in that system. Okay. Okay. There's a lot of unmet needs. So what um, we propose is that POST, which is um, to be a, in law enforcement, we post certified peace officer standard training council, and you get trained at the center down at Forsyth. And so one of the courses that I'd like to see required for all officers is post-traumatic stress disorder training and how to identify a person who might have post-traumatic stress disorder. And hopefully if you can identify them, there won't be a, there won't be a, you know, a negative interaction as far as any kind of shooting or, you know, we can hopefully help both sides do a better job of that. As in police officers equip them to be able to deal with this because a lot of them don't have that training. And the people with unmet needs, <coughs> we are trying to get towards that. Okay? And then there's a few others here, but I'll I'll jump to sorry, before we move on, do you mind if I ask a question about that or do you want me to come back? If you don't mind, come back so I can make sure everybody gets it's the full potato here, or the full <laughs> banana or whatever we want. Something specific to Gwinnett County and veterans again. I don't know if y'all know, but we have the fourth highest, the fourth highest population of veterans in Georgia. We have some of the least services for veterans, and in fact, our veteran service clinics are within two miles of each other, and it's a 400 square mile county. So there's something called an urging resolution, which means I urge you, or we the Senate urge you, to do something, and that's what we passed. We, the Senate, urge the Veterans Administration to come to Gwinnett and look at putting at least one more clinic here with more services. Um, and we don't have a lot of full service clinics either. Uh, Cobb County recently got a new Veterans Administration clinic, and they're going to have all kinds of services there from to include women's services, which there are very few of. And so that's one thing we're doing. We're looking at Fort Gwinnett County in specific. Um, the last thing I wanted to bring up, and, and this was something that happened in the very, well, I don't know, the first 24 hours I was there. When we come to the Senate, we make rules. And the rules are how we're supposed to abide and how we're supposed to interact with each other. Like I'm not supposed to call you by your, your name. I'm supposed to say the lady from Hansen or the lady from the 48th district, or the senator from the 48th district. That's just an example of a rule. Well, as a new woman senator, there were two things that bothered me about these rules, and you may have read about it in the paper, because somebody paid attention. One is sexual harassment claims. The majority decided that they wanted to make it more difficult for people, and it puts men, they can be sexually arrested to report. And if you're running for office, you get extra protection. If you've registered, if you've, uh, if you've signed up to run for office, during the time that you run for office, a claim cannot be brought under the Senate rules. Now, this doesn't apply in court, okay? This is in the Senate rules. But a lot of times, a young person will come to me, a senator, and say, look, something's going on. If it's during the time somebody's running for office, I can't do anything about it under those rules. Uh, that hasn't happened yet, so when that happens, we'll see what I do about it. But I'm just telling you, that's currently the rule. And um, obviously, the women were not happy with the rules, and some men were not happy with the rules, and we are in the process of trying to negotiate to get those changed. But from my perspective, that was not something that we need to be doing at the very first moment we arrived at the Capitol. We got so many things going on, we got to change the rules. And the second one was to limit your ability to protest at the Capitol. Wearing, okay, I got a, what's it called? Badge. A badge. They had a rule about what, you know, you can't have certain paraphernalia and all this, which in my mind violates the First Amendment to the Constitution, which is you get to come, show. You get to speak and you get to show your grievances to your government. How are you going to show your grievances 
and you can't wear a pin, you can't wear a shirt, and you can't say anything. So uh, that was another area that is also under negotiation. And these rules are now halfway through and we don't have them done yet. But those were two things that really, um, as a veteran, bothered me because I actually have read the Constitution and have pledged to uphold it several times. I think three or four times in my life now as a federal prosecutor, as a veteran, as a law clerk, and as a senator. So four times. The last thing is the Equal Rights Amendment. How many of you think that the Constitution says women are equal? How many people think it currently exists in the Constitution? I mean, y'all are smart. I actually thought, I hadn't, I hadn't really thought about it. I was like, I can't believe that. Well, actually, I'll tell you what my husband said. He's like, you mean that wasn't done like back in the 70s? You know, when we were little? I mean, I was, I was young in the 70s. And a lot of people think that. They're like, I didn't know that wasn't part of the Constitution. It doesn't say women are equal. No, it does not say women are equal. So, if we, we dropped a bill, again, it's in the hopper, it's bipartisan, okay? Women on both sides of the aisle, there are only two Republican women in the Senate, they both co-signed, and men on both sides, Republican and Democrat signed on. If we pass the Equal Rights Amendment here in Georgia, we will be the 38th state, and the 38 states are what's necessary to amend the Constitution because you have to have three quarters of the states to be able to do that. Now the race is on because there's a few other states who could also be the 38th state. And I'm hoping that Georgia will step up and be the 38th state. But that is something you need to be heard on because there are very loud people saying that this goes, I mean, there are arguments that, that really distract from the main issue. This is not an abortion bill. It's not about abortion, this is equal rights. It is not about abortion. And if it were about abortion, there are several senators who would have not signed on because they actually have a different opinion on that. So everybody on this bill has different opinions on that issue. But we all agree that it should say in the Constitution that men are equal. So I think I've covered the broad side of that. And I don't want to drag it out too long. And I want to be representative part to be able to answer questions too. Because yeah, we, we work, it's open to everybody, but yes, me. So I have a couple of questions. Um, I know Georgia's way better than North Carolina, but- We are way better. We are better, I know, <laughs> my the government's better, but a couple of things I want to ask you, you were talking about how um, for state employees, uh, the state, the, the government, the state government is taking control of, uh, or taking, uh, being more in control of uh, insurance, of costs, and basically saying that we're gonna dictate how much you can charge and that's gonna lower um, costs for a lot of state employees. So right now in Georgia, there are so many state employees. Mm -hmm. Why, is there anything in the workshop, has anybody thought of saying, okay, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Kaiser, you guys sit down. If you want our business, you can charge this much, take it or leave it. We know it's funny, but it's the only time our, our, our premiums don't go up is when, when the governor's up for re-election. <laughs> Otherwise, like I was telling Sam a little while ago, our paychecks you know, are, are less now per month than they were a few years ago because we're not getting raises, but our premiums are going up. Right, right. So right. with so many people, why can't the government say, look, you don't want you don't want to you know insure our people, we'll move on to the next uh, insurance company. So I'm not an expert in this area, but I do know enough that if you pool Know, pool groups together like P-O-O-L. There are pools of people and you have greater numbers you can negotiate for better rates. Right. And I so have asked about that. I, I have not heard anybody at the Capitol talking about that point, to be honest with you. Uh, but I know that I myself asked that question. I didn't say it specifically for state employees. I just said, look, if we had a larger pool, P-O-O-L, wouldn't we be able to negotiate and get better rates? Because we have more people coming together to share the cost then you can get better rates. But, love to hear from you if you have more on that. Okay. Got my I mean, in theory, so. that's, that's true, but it's not happening for us. No, so I know it's not happening. Except when a government governor wants to be elected. So, so we do have an insurance commission, right? Which is a statewide position. Uh, and based on whether or not they use the power that they have or the discretion that they have, that's another factor, right? Um, uncompensated healthcare costs, 
when we're talking about our own private health insurance premiums is another factor, right? Which is why, which is why another reason why I'm such a strong advocate for Medicare. I think there was a study saying back in 2016, for the metro Atlanta area alone, there were one billion dollars of uncompensated healthcare costs in here. Where where does that cost go? Who eats that up? That's that's those who have private health insurance, right? Um, because these are for-profit uh, industries. But but again, it's, there's many factors in the very um, if, if you don't mind, because I, I hope I didn't I hope I didn't make it too much of a downer. No, 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 uh, I'm just saying. You want to say what you, what you, what y'all think? Sure. Yeah, let's hear from the houses then. I'm, I'm excited because we get to hear across the hall. The houses. Okay, I don't know, see what they're doing. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so I'll, let me let me take a big step back in the voting rights, but it's just been so focused on. <laughs> but it, it, it's quite interesting uh, because you know at, at the national level it's we're hyper partisan, right? But then at the state level, uh, this is something that I'm very proud to say, there, there is bipartisanship. There is broader under the Gold Dome. And oftentimes, some of the greatest conflict that exists is between the House and the Senate. Crap. <laughs> because, I, I, and that's not, a, that's not a joke, or that's, that's for real. Um, sometimes- Except we have all these new people this year, and we, we have a whole different <laughs> approach to that. I actually speak to the representatives. Right. You know, okay. and, and you guys come over and speak to me, and we visit. That's right. But actually, you laugh. Really? What are y'all doing over here? I'm like, well, we need to get them come over. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it, it, it sounds like high school, but, you know. Uh, so, I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah. I think we've zoomed in as to a microscopic level when it comes to this uh, House Bill 316. Let me take a big step back and talk about the state as well, right? Uh, you know, being, being a native Georgian born and raised, we are moving in the right direction on many, many things, and we should be very, very proud. Um, one statistic that always, uh, one really surprised me, but one I'm also grateful for. Every single bill that comes to the House floor, all right, how, how many, all right, let me, uh, let me rephrase that. I think 95% of every bill that reaches the House floor, uh, Republicans vote yes. All right. What do you think is the ratio for Democrats? If almost 95, 99% of every bill, Republicans will vote against it, passes. 50%, 60%? Anybody? We are. We got shy group here. Almost 88%, 88% of every single bill that reaches the House floor, there is almost unanimous agreement on it. Right. I believe, in fact, uh, that the person who votes no the most in the state house is a Republican from North Georgia. <laughs> right. Same thing in the Senate, man. Sorry, there must be something moderate there. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm from there, so I've been there. <laughs> um, but, but that said, you know, there, there's a lot of common ground uh, <coughs> where, where oftentimes the objective is the same. It's the manner in which we achieve that objective. Right? The debate over health care is similar, though I do have many problems with SB 106. Um, but, but that said, I think one of the things, especially here in Georgia, that we have to be constantly mindful of, especially in the political environment that we're in, is that when all is said and done, right, we are all Georgians, we are all Americans, right? let us have our debates over these issues, but we have to come back together. If we continue to divide along these lines, all that does make us weaker as a nation. All that does is make us weaker as a state. And so I just wanted to touch upon some bipartisan initiatives um, that we are continuing to move forward and that we will continue to make progress on. Rural broadband is, yeah. I think, something yeah. that is incredibly exciting. Right? Not just for rural Georgia who desperately needs it, but here in Metro Atlanta, we're talking about the potential for 5G being available to all of um, House Bill 23 and House Bill 184 are two key pieces of legislation that have probably 95 to 99% support, right? That would allow us to move forward in that direction. Uh, another incredibly exciting thing that we have going for us here in Georgia is the Fortis Event. Um, I have the opportunity to serve on an international trade and commerce subcommittee. Uh, they had a presentation about the Port of Savannah deepening and the expansion around that entire area. It is truly, truly incredible. 
and it really, really makes the crowd beautiful. When you watch his presentations, if you go down to Savannah, which is absolutely incredibly beautiful, but all the transformation that's going on over there, uh, that area is truly, if not already, uh, is becoming the, um, uh, the, the heart's field of import and export, international trade. And all of that, all of that is going through Georgia. Uh, there have been study committees introduced to see if we can create high-speed rail between Atlanta and Savannah. Right? And so we are also talking about these big idea projects which requires us to all be on the same page. We can't allow politics to get in the way of making progress on the things that we need. Um, there have, so, uh, if y'all know or do not know, uh, currently, um, the metro Atlanta area of Georgia, we have an HIV AIDS epidemic, which is a shame, because we are the home of the CDC. It's, it's inexcusable. We have made progress on HIV AIDS legislation this year. Right. There is a, a three-year pilot program that is going to be uh, heard tomorrow on the House floor, and that will likely pass with enormous bipartisan support. Because we have to make progress on this issue, especially when it's something that we can actually uh, make, to, we can save lives if we come together on this issue. All right? And there's finally some progress being made on it. Let's see. And Mm -hmm. ask about that. Yes. So, as y'all may know, uh, the federal government passed legislation that would allow industrial hemp to be manufactured. Uh, we passed a few days ago House Bill 213, which is a Georgia Hemp Farming Act, uh, which again makes progress on that. Um, I, I believe tomorrow we're going to be hearing a bill, House Bill 324, I believe, uh, that would allow us to begin manufacturing um, CBD because currently uh, CBD or medical marijuana is currently very, very limited here in the state of Georgia, right? Uh, the, the oil is permitted, but it's a felony if you get it from across state lines, and that's the only way that you can get it from, right? <laughs> and I know, I know. And, and this is a bipartisan issue. Uh, we've actually had Republicans lead the effort. I tip my hat to uh, former state representative Alan Peake, he used to be a governor's floor leader, but led the fight on this issue because of the kids who need this medicine. Um, and there is still this bipartisan support um, helping us move forward on this uh, vital, vital, vital issue. Do you have a question? No, I was going to ask you some status of that. I, uh, I mean, so that's, that's, that's the status. Well, yes. Because yes. I know they made it legal, but there was no way to get it. So it was like, what was the point? You looked at everybody fought for you, but then nothing could happen about it. Unless you move to another state. But then you can't bring it in. That's right. Or you're gonna you know. Now we're gonna pass it out of the house. I can almost 100 percent guarantee you that. Once it goes over to the Senate, we'll see what they do. They'll see. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, not clear, nearly as clear in the Senate as I guess the House. But there's a gentleman over here who's been waiting oh, a long time for Are you yeah. dyslexic? Maybe I should no. answer. Yeah. See? <laughs> <laughs> There's actually four, four senators. Oh. Okay. And what I'm concerned about like, is this here that like, children with disabilities, like members of the particular, there's a host of other children also, with like, and other conditions also. And I, like, I raise a question about what I mean. Like, oh, why did you be so narrow, narrow, which is this disorder, what about other, other children, other disorders that like, well, baby steps, for one. But also, there's a couple other words. It's dyslexia, and there's like three other ones. And then it says, while you're evaluating them for these four disorders, I just say dyslexia is the easiest to remember, and the one I understand uh, the most. There are four disorders, and then while you're looking for those, if you identify, you're like able to identify something else. So it could lead to early identification of hearing issues or some issue going on. So it's not as narrow as I made it sound, so I apologize for that. But, um, you know, we don't, we'll have to see how that happens. And of course, we want to hear from people who are in the field actually doing this and say, hey, this is working great, or no, it's not working great, we need to tweak the statute, or oh, we've got the epidemic of some other thing with children that we need to look at. So, here's my question. 
Yes, uh, uh, my other question, my other question that I'm not dealing with the other the other question came back, it had to do with a uh, uh, question around uh, the constitutional uh, uh, question about, 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 about uh, putting uh, women in the constitutional rights and voting stuff back. Now, um, this question has to do with about how, how, how do we deal with, you know, given that now we're more involved now with that, we're in terms of see sexuality and gender as far more on the continuum and spectrum itself, how do we deal with people Strange gender and stuff like that, and does it create potential for that to be gaps and loopholes? Like now, I know there's an answer to this, and I'm trying to remember yeah. because it's late at night. So, it's, <laughs> it's, we, we have a specific word, it's the correct word. Okay. So what is the word? I believe it, it says um, equal treatment regardless of sex. That's okay. right. Okay. So it says sex, it doesn't say okay. gender. Right. Okay. okay. I think that's right. Because the specific word includes everything. So we don't have to get into the the whole other conversation, and those folks are still protected okay. under that definition. Thank you. By the way, this is my senior advisor here, um, Kevin Kahn, and, and when you call and email, he'll be probably the first person to see it, and he helps pull it all together for me. So just so you know, he's here to, uh, to help. The, the last bipartisan bill that I'll mention yeah. I would like to go over to the Senate uh, is uh, hate crimes legislation. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, uh, Did that pass? Uh, it's uh, hasn't gotten to full scale. Oh, okay. Um, but with the hate crimes legislation, this is being carried by the chairman of the non-judiciary uh, committee, Chuck Estration. Uh, sign, second signer is Karen Bennett, who is the chair of the Georgia Legislative Black Caucus. So there's bipartisan support for this vitally important bill um, that will help, hopefully allow it to move forward. Georgia is one of five states in the nation, one of five states that does not have uh, hate crimes legislation on the books. Right. Uh, so it's essentially putting us, catching us up where everybody else is. Um, so, so that said, uh, I'm happy to take questions, conversation. Can you think of another four states where they don't have hate crimes? Alabama, Mississippi. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm not Alabama, so I can say that. One of these, one of these young folks can probably Google it real quick. <laughs> oh, they're so good with technology. I mean, I can Google it too, but I'm not as fast. Alabama does have hand marked paper ballots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just asking before you were talking about the PTSD portion, right? The PTSD training for law yes. enforcement. Mm -hmm. I also think it's very important. I work with students at the middle school level with mild intellect. And the other day, we had a behavior specialist come and meet with us. And he was telling us, you know, because we feel a lot of the things that the students are doing makes people uncomfortable when we go to the community. We go through community skills every week to the mall. Just, just things that we wouldn't do, but what part So, So the behavior specialist told us, unfortunately, a high percentage, and I don't know the numbers, I don't want to give it, but a high percentage of these students are misunderstood in situations where they'll tell them, stop, or don't do this and don't do that, and they don't react properly. So unfortunately, they're part of these situations they did at the jail or got to bit other situations. So I think that's also very important to include in there for students or adults or anybody yeah. with intellectual disabilities. So just so you know, right. I'm number 55 and you're say number 56 right. law enforcement. Right. That's something you're actually talking about. Okay. But we are talking about expanding the training for, for um, law enforcement to include some of these other areas. However, that does cost money, and so we got to get a, another fiscal impact statement. And we're going to, after the session, look at that more uh, because we hope to bring a bipartisan bill to put forth this kind of training again to help in these high intensity, you know, interactions between police and and folks, so that police officers are better equipped to deal with that and be able to make those quick decisions that they have to make. As they also are dealing with, you know, sometimes there are folks trying to kill them, and then sometimes there are folks that are being misunderstood, and we're trying to help bridge that gap, and uh, and that's what I'm very proud of. I can get number 55 and number 56. His name is Senator Robertson, Randy Robertson from Columbus. So he's from Columbus. But anyway, that's something we're looking at. I mean, but we haven't we haven't figured all that out yet. So if you want to give us some stuff on that, I'd be happy to you know put it in our folder that we're working on. But that that is PTSD from my perspective is just the first step. And then yes, yes, sir.